Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second day of SEO for Developers series uh, live with Search Engine Land. Uh, and for those of you who didn't get a chance to uh, catch the first day, which was yesterday, uh, don't worry. You can catch it on demand later on at the Search Engine Live uh, or Search Engine uh, Search Engine Land's uh, YouTube video channel. So check us out there. Uh, and uh, today, this is the second of three interactive sessions, including conversations, including live coding and Q&A with experts who are knowledgeable in coding and how that coding affects your SEO. Very important topic. So hope you uh, join us and from whether you're on the developer side or the SEO side and looking to uh, for new skills to improve your effectiveness. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you for today's session, John Murch, uh, president of Nomad Thinking. He's here to talk about how JavaScript developers are able to use headless Chrome to do almost anything a browser can do, uh, connect with page information from Google Search Console, scrape links, check canonical tags, and much more. He'll cover the basics of Puppeteer and walk through an example of open source JavaScript and Puppeteer examples. Welcome, John. And, and just before, uh, we get into it. Uh, bear in mind, we'll be answering questions. And if you don't see it yet, uh, please scroll down. You'll find the live Q&A uh, widget at the bottom of your screen. You may have to scroll down to see the Q&A chat box. We'll get to as many questions as we possibly can during the presentation. Uh, and it, it, we, we will probably be doing a Google Hangout post uh, session. So if you have uh, questions that don't get answered, check us out there. Uh, now, John, welcome. How are you? Terrific, thanks for having me. Um, excited to talk about Puppeteer and show some code and do some coding and uh, uh, answer you know, a ton of questions from there. So, awesome. Great. Wonderful, all right. So we're gonna go ahead and switch into a presentation view here and bring you up. So, there awesome. we go, awesome. Cheers, thanks, John. Sure, thank you. So yes, my name is John Murch. Uh, thanks again for having me here. Uh, I'll be speaking about Puppeteer, kind of uh, outlined a, a quick agenda here. So we'll talk about all things uh, Puppeteer, what is it, uh, how it relates, what would be useful. Uh, I'm gonna show a quick demo of uh, basically uh, it using. Uh, I'm also gonna kind of go through some of the basics from a coding standpoint, walk through those, and then finally do a bit of a code review on a few different scrapes. Uh, and all this code will be open source, and I'll be providing the link to a GitHub repo that you'll be able to download. So a uh, quick background, I graduated computer science degree, University of Vermont, go Catamounts. Uh, I'm a developer at heart, but I got into SEO back in 2005, building WordPress websites for clients and driving organic search. I've worked on a few different types of small mom and pop shop sites, as well as large enterprise uh, million plus URL sites. Um, but most of my day-to-day -day now is just more back-end development, doing full stack and writing scripts and uh, fun bots to scrape the internet with Puppeteer. So with that, so what exactly is Puppeteer? So I pulled this exactly from the Puppeteer um, uh, documentation site, pptr.dev, but Puppeteer is a node library which provides a high-level API to control headless Chrome and Chromium over the DevTools protocol. There's a lot in that that I kind of want to break down, it's both kind of uh, helping out either from the non-developers that may be on this call or even just from the developers and talking through that. So Puppeteer is a Node library. So Node is server-side uh, JavaScript. Uh, there are other unofficial libraries uh, in other language like Puppeteer or Puppeteer Go in Python and Golang. With that, it, it provides a high-level API to control headless Chrome and Chromium. So to understand kind of the, the nuance there, so headless Chrome is Google's IP. Chromium is Chrome, but the open source version without Google's IP. So just kind of the nomenclature from that. And then over DevTools protocol. So we all love Chromium DevTools protocol. So it allows us to do different types of inspecting, debugging, uh, profile of uh, Chromium or Chrome and other Blink-based browsers, uh, which we'll get into in a bit. 
So I uh, blatantly ripped this off, but I feel like it really helps paint the picture of understanding when we talk about Puppeteer, what exactly are we talking about from a visual standpoint? So we have uh, all these kind of uh, different parts of what's referred to as the pyramid of Puppeteer. Uh, I pulled this out of uh, Google I.O. 2018 from Erica Bedelin, uh, and this really kind of sums it up and paint a clear picture for me, so I hope that this paints a clear picture for you as well. So starting from the bottom to the top, we have headless Chrome. So headless Chrome is basically Chrome without Chrome. There is no UI. You can run Chrome from the command line, dumping the DOM or generating screenshots, which I'll be showing in a bit. And then we have uh, CDP or the Chrome Development Tools Protocol. So as I was saying, this uh, allows you to do different types of inspection, debugging. Uh, this can also be useful for things like Web Vitals, looking at the different uh, performance um, issues your website might be having. And then finally, you get to the Puppeteer. So this is the API layer. So this would be for generating screenshots or PDFs, uh, using input from the keyboard or mouse, doing different types of uh, pre-rendering for server-side rendering if you're running some type of front end like uh, React or or view. Um, and then there's finally kind of your code. So th this is what you're going to do to control the browser. And you're going to leverage Puppeteer, which then you know leverages the Chrome DevTools and Headless Chrome. And it kind of makes a, a solid pyramid from there. So um, I, I hope that helps other people. It kind of um, helped me along the way of just kind of understanding the building blocks of everything. So with that. Let's do a quick demo and say, what exactly are you talking about from here? OK, so I have VS Code. Uh, I'll, we'll dive into the script in a bit, but I'm just going to run this. So this is going to fetch uh, some random URLs, pull out the status code, the page title, uh, and actually walk through the uh, um, Chrome browser uh, sequentially. So here I just built a queue of different web pages it's going to visit. It's going to pull the status code, the URL, and the page title for each of these pages. So here I have this um, uh, basically running locally on my machine, and I'm able to visit um, these different websites, parse out the page title, um, and uh, continue on You know, going from there. So uh, it's it's pretty interesting. We'll be diving into some of the code in a second here, but I just wanted to kind of give an example going through um, what exactly we're talking about from here. So with that, so for the non-developers on here, I didn't want to dive just straight into an IDE of VS Code or something. I kind of wanted to break it down on, on a slide here and, and kind of go from there. So I think this might be a little helpful from there. So Puppeteer, you need to basically understand that there's really two or three things that every script in some way or shape or form is going to have. So you're going to have basically your browser or your Puppeteer launch. So this will control all the various settings you want in your actual Chrome um, browser. And then from there, you'd have basically your page or tab. So this would be all the settings like user agent or viewport, or maybe you're emulating a mobile phone or something. And then from there, you're going to visit some website and then do some type of process. And then finally, you're going to shut down uh, the browser and continue on with your way. So you know, understanding some of these building blocks as we start kind of going from here and, and continuing on. And, you know, when you think about Puppeteer, all the things you want to do, you know, is whether it's from a search perspective, there could be different things of doing competitive analysis for web scraping, or it could be just even pulling down data from uh, an API that, um, you know, is maybe all generated on the front end, and so you can't just curl that data. So kind of step things up a notch a little bit. So here we have basically, we create the browser, we create the page, we're going to visit tesla.com, and then we're going to basically uh, 
download or take the DOM. So this is the server-side generated um, JavaScript as well as the source. Here we're using response.txt where it's basically taking the response from the visiting um, and, and storing that. And we can do something from that and I'll be going into uh, detail with that, but you'd be able to do a diff on it or you know look at the two and compare um, from there. Uh, another code example, kind of take it next step further and introduce a few more things. So here we're basically visiting tesla.com. We're grabbing the page title. So with Puppeteer, we just have uh, a page method. We're calling uh, a title on that. And then for the descript uh, description, for the meta description, we're basically doing a page evaluate and we're evaluating that uh, element and then basically collecting the content. And the page dollar sign you could basically see as doing a document .query, um, versus if you did a page double dollar sign, you'd be doing a document .query .all. Um, and so you're able to get the page title or description, which could be useful when um, basically either you need to scrape your own site for data you're not sure of, or even a competitor or something from there. So I'm going to kind of switch gears, but um, now would be a good time to take a screenshot of the site. So this is where all the code that I'll be going through is. Uh, I'll be going through just kind of the basic scripts that I just outlined uh, above, as well as going through a, a basic backlink checker, um, visiting a site, checking to see if a link's on it, um, grabbing the anchor text or um, rel attribute, similarly uh, doing a redirect checker to check the status code. And then kind of as a bonus, um, showing off Google Search con uh, Console. So if you were to go to Google Search Console and uh, download your links, the latest links, uh, I just use basically a standard um, CSV in there and you can just replace it. I I just put in a, a shorter version of what uh, I have for one of my personal websites. Okay, so now on to the fun stuff. So first, let's get situated here. So we talked about Hem Hemlet's Chrome a little bit and I kind of wanted to go through and, and show what exactly that means. So here I am in the terminal in VS Code. Um, so we're basically going to run this generate screenshot. So it's gonna visit Google and actually um, open up and generate a screenshot. So here I'm running this basically from the terminal. There's no browser or anything that opens and you're able to generate a screenshot. Similarly, if I, I can run basically uh, a DOM dump of a URL. So this is of uh, twitter.com slash explore. So I can grab, this is all the generated um, JavaScript. So again, I didn't necessarily open up a browser, but I can view um, some of the information from there. So I just kind of wanted to start small and kind of continue on with that. So we're gonna kind of work our way back from where we were. So if we go to uh, our, our initial script, so we open up a browser, we open up the page, and then we visit the page and we do something there. So this isn't gonna necessarily do anything. Uh, well, it'll fetch Tesla, but it won't do anything with it. <laughs> exactly. So I just wanna kinda, yep, sure, go for it. Oh, just a real quick question. Someone was asking, what are the options for running Puppeteer in the cloud? Yeah, so uh, it's actually a good question. So for all this demo here, I'm just gonna go through more of Roku running it locally, but in terms right. of running it in the cloud, you could use Firebase, DigitalOcean, AWS, um, do more of like a Lambda serverless. There's different pros and cons for why you would want to run them in different types of cloud environment. So for example, the boot time of launching Chrome is actually can take a few seconds. Um, so another kind of cheat way of doing that is you can, um, uh, pool or run different um, 
instances of Chrome and then connect to them and uh, um, launch them from there. So it, it kind of depends on, on what you're either scraping or crawling from there. And uh, do you, when you run locally, do you recommend uh, running it in a virtual machine or are you good with uh, doing it? Uh... So I'm on a Mac, but I just run it from uh, my laptop. I, I don't run it from a virtual machine or anything like that. I, I have um, ran things off of um, like digital ocean boxes, uh, for example, that uh, I may SSH to and then run it from there. But most right. of the time, uh, I run it locally. And then once I feel confident, I push it up through Git and then run it on the server I'm using. So you're not doing any containerization or anything. And when you, when you, when you do that, you might be doing that because you're worried about getting uh, your IP banned from Google, maybe, or something. Um, yeah, there's kind of a few things with that. So um, you know, you can run uh, an access as a proxy from um, Puppeteer to be able to use like a back connected proxy. So if you had a static IP, they would do the IP rotation on their end, and you just you know connect and pass through. But um, they, there's kind of again, it, it depends like a standard I guess SEO response, but uh, of what you're trying to <laughs> scrape or, or do. Yeah. So basic scraper here. So you're scraping Tesla, but you haven't done anything with it yet. So you're not really scraping your, you're just fetching it. Exactly. And so here, just kind of going through. So here I'm going to do YouTube. Um, so we're going to do. So here we're going to basically download the DOM and the source from uh, YouTube. And so we're going to then save it here to this. Uh, I just have a reports folder um, for the two. So if we go back to reports, we can do a diff compare. So give it a second while it generates that. Uh, and this is v VS Code doing a diff. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so for example, if you're looking at you know, maybe you're doing a lot of front end uh, with React or Vue or something. You'd want to look at basically the page source versus the DOM. What may be different? What might be generated? Um, so uh, it's kind of nice that with Puppeteer you can fetch both of them and then you know do a diff afterwards. Or you and know, incredibly useful if you were working on figuring out what parts of your application you want to do server side rendering and what parts you might want to hydrate. You can do this diff on your site to see yeah. what parts are, yeah. Yeah, so it's just kind of one of those um, nice things to have in your wheelhouse or bucket of being able to be like, oh, let me just take a look to see, you know, what I'm seeing versus, you know, what they're seeing. And similarly, you can also, um, I'll get to this in a bit, but also disable certain things from rendering. Um, mm -hmm. So if you want to block images or maybe, you know, an ad network or something that's on the page to do a test of what's happening or why it's killing my performance, you could do something like that from there. Sweet. Sweet. So I'm going to work my way through some of these more basic ones and just kind of go through it. So um, getting back to uh, basically the title. Uh, oops. A title and meta whoops that up for you. So here we're going back to Tesla.com. We're opening the browser page, we're visiting, we're gonna read the uh, page title. So here's basically fetching the title and puppeteer, and then we're gonna evaluate the meta description. And then here, what I did was I just generate a quick object. Um, of results that have the URL, the title, and description, and just output it to the console. But here, you could easily um, add it to a, a CSV, or post it to an API, or save it to a database. But you know, just kind of understanding the fundamentals and basics before you start building out a, a bigger, more robust um, script. So the next one up, which I always have a lot of fun with, is I like to look at the uh, console log on DevTools a lot when I'm visiting sites to see what they're uh, outputting. Um, it's funny, so CNN actually outputs um, a nice ASCII <laughs> art, um, as well as some other um, 
useful, I guess, information. There, there's a few different, you know, sites that posted up doing different types of uh, uh, requests for either hire or, you know, saying, you know, uh, you know, only bots should be here. Um, I, I have a lot of fun scraping robots.txt files and sitemaps, so, you know, really enjoy that. So next one up, we're going to do a few different things here, and I'm gonna start the code. So we're gonna show off just basic screenshots, and there's basically gonna be three different screenshots, and I'm gonna start expanding some of the, the actual um, code from there. So here, we're opening up a browser like normal, we're opening up a page, but now we're gonna start adding some settings here. So we're gonna set the viewport by 1920 by 1080. So now we have a window that will be opening up for, for the, in the browser of that specific um, size. In addition, we'll be setting a user agent. So by default, um, th th this gets into kind of how much of a bot are you a bot? Um, or certain sites may, you know, um, block by user agents. So kind of just starting to showcase the fundamentals of, of ways of being able to do this in Puppeteer. Uh, further along, I show you a few other ways of setting this information by default. So here we'll open up uh, Reddit. We're gonna wait for the page title. We're gonna take a screenshot of the top of the page. We're gonna take a screenshot of a clip at a specific location on the page and the size of the page. And then lastly, we're gonna take a full screenshot. Nice. So, whoops. so oh, come on. Go. Oh, your terminal. Yeah. Not being responsive. Control C oh, maybe and start it again or Yeah. Just gonna... There we go. Okay. I have the exact same prompt, the uh, oh my Z H uh uh, oh, really? Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I use exactly the same one with the yeah. master branch, the Git, the Git uh, so, integration. So, I, I guess I should be noting here. So, I'm running this um, headless, so that's why you're not necessarily seeing anything um, open up top. Uh, but uh, if you go through, it might be just an error. But I'm just going to show you some of the. So, it opened up Reddit. It's creating basically some of the image clips. So this is a clip on the site. Uh, this is going to be a full image of Reddit. So. Oh wow! Yeah, look at that. Yeah. So their uh, puppeteer over the years has definitely um, expanded and improved some of their rendering capability. Um, when it first came out, there was a lot of kind of issues with some of that. So um, it's it's definitely it's version. Definitely it's version three now, sure. and it's kind of just come out with version three, right? So a lot of this functionality has come a long ways. Yeah, and there, there's you know many different ways we can slice and dice and, and, and talk about that. I'm sure we will, but um, I just kind of want to show some of the basics and things, you know. And and screenshots are so helpful and useful for looking at basically competitor data or even your own site and generating and different things, whether it be rendering a mobile or tablet. Um, or a desktop. So here we're gonna, oh, why that keeps crashing. Okay, so here we're gonna actually open up a browser, visit amazon.com um, and uh, we're just gonna close it after there. But um, we're gonna start introducing some of the kind of puppeteer options and setting for a specific browser. So here we have um, uh, headless false. So this basically is meaning I want to open up the browser and see it as it runs. Uh, ignore HTTPS errors. So if you have um, uh, mixed content, HTTP, HTTPS, I'm just gonna ignore that and continue on my way. But um, this can also be useful for identifying uh, issues with um, mixed uh, content, especially when you're scraping your own site. Uh, slow mo basically adds a uh, time to wait in milliseconds for it to launch the page. Um, we'll get to that in 
just a little bit. And then the args, no sandbox. So this is kind of getting back deeper into Puppeteer in terms of if you were running this on a virtual console, um, Puppeteer accesses different parts or privileges of the computer system. And so um, we're just kind of going to ignore all of that and continue on from there. Um, so here I still have the set viewport, but we'll be um, showcasing more of that. So the next one, we're basically just going to wait for three seconds. So this is in milliseconds. That's why it's by a thousand. And then close the browser. So here, Um, we're going to open up the browser, go to Amazon.com. We're going to count to three while the page is loading, and then we're just going to close it down. So there can be different uses for here. So you may want to open the page and wait for a specific DOM element to be generated or loaded based on what you're trying to do. You also may just want to add a time delay of when you're actually fetching that page. So here, we're going to start adding a bit more options to this kind of puppeteer um, settings I have here. So let me make this a little bit bigger so you guys can read it. So here, we still have the uh, headless false. Um, we're going to ignore the HTTPS, but now we're going to set the default uh, viewport. So here, we're setting it for 375 and 667. And then we're going to actually set the uh, is mobile to true and then give it a mobile user agent. And again, the arguments for the no sandbox. So that gets pushed into the browser. We still open up a normal page. We're going to go to Amazon, wait for three seconds. But now this time, it's going to look slightly different. Mobile. Yeah. So um, you can. Uh, you know, be able to emulate different um, browser settings as you would, you know, from there uh, and uh, kind of go from there. This kind of last one from the basics um, in, in my list uh, is basically we're going to go to Amazon. We're going to type in their search box searching for a four terabyte external hard drive, and then we will pull the first listing uh, from it. So um, this kind of touches on a, a few different things. So, so now we have, uh, it's going to actually use the slow-mo for interaction between. We're going to introduce kind of a timeout. So this, this is 30 seconds. It's a millisecond, so times 1,000 um, in case the page doesn't load from there. We're going to basically select this element from the page and type in this uh, search query. We're going to wait one second. So again, milliseconds, uh, uh, one times a thousand. We're going to click search and then wait for basically the uh, one of the images to load. We're going to take a screenshot of that page. And then um, here we're going to basically do is fetch the um, first element and then we're going to get the, the link to it and then the text from it. Uh, and then print it out um, as just an object in the browser. I'm sorry, in, uh, in the console. Nice. Basically fetching an Amazon search result and taking yeah. screenshots. Yeah, so there's uh, kind of a, a few things from there. Um, so here, now you see the viewport's a little bit bigger. You can see the, the full display. You can see it type in, uh, wait the second, click it. It's going to generate and grab that first response yep. for that Seagate. Um, uh, did that not, I think I may have just not saved it. But yeah, but here's the uh, uh, image for the search results saving there. It's got to debug the response object, right? Yeah, I think uh, I just had a slight error in there. So, I mean, there, there's many different kind of ways to skin a tech cat in terms of, you know, web scraping for different types of use. I just kind of wanted to go through some more of the, the basics outlined here and, and kind of go from it. So um, with that, I see like there's a few questions I may kind of answer before we dive into the next one and, and go from there. Yeah, it starts asking, uh, 
what makes puppeteer different than screaming frog and there's some discussion on this in this regard because it is clearly different and i think targeted at different audiences anyway yeah so screaming frog is basically a, a web scraper there's many different functionalities you can and do uh, it wasn't until gee i guess maybe four years ago they introduced doing javascript rendering um right there are the, there's a lot that you can do with Screaming Frog. With Puppeteer, you have to code that type of functionality, but it also gives you options to do things that may not be as easy to do uh, with Screaming Frog, whether that be parsing the data um, uh, of the site or um, doing different types of proxy rotation, or even just in a sense of scraping a million pages on your local laptop. If you tried scraping a million pages with Screaming Frog, you're gonna run out of RAM unless you have like a new Mac Pro or, or some <laughs> very expensive machine. Right. Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, I think for rendering, you need the Pro version. Uh, Puppeteer is an open source project. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you, yeah, you can definitely uh, submit pull requests and and kind of go from there. And the community is really great on GitHub. And so again, so this is just the link if you want to download them uh, for all these code samples that I'm doing. So with that, let's jump into a little bit more um, kind of code and go from there. Um, so we're going to kind of work our way top down, but um, uh, JavaScript is always funny depending on kind of order of execution, so we'll, we'll get that. But we basically have um, our, our standard um, options that we've kind of been using. Here we're going to basically uh, generate a CSV and just output some of the headings, status code, URL, backlink, anchor, uh, the rel, and then if it exists. So this is just kind of setting up the framework of that file. Here we have a function for fetching. So fetching is going to open up that Puppeteer browser. Now here, I'm, I'm basically going to be blocking some of the heavier content because I just want to know if that links on that page. So for example, image, um, style sheets, media, font. So the idea here is I just want to run as fast as possible, getting rid of all the other stuff. Just give me the DOM and you know let's go. Um, so here I set the user agent and the viewport. Uh, here, this is uh, kind of very important to Puppeteer. So we set the request interception to true. So here, there's different types of uh, events um, or event emitters on the page that you can uh, hook into. So in this case, we're looking at all the requests coming to that page. We want to block any of them that are in that array. Uh, if not, we'll just kind of continue. So here we're just going to basically be like, if it's an image or style sheet or any of the other ones types in here, we're just gonna ignore it and not process that. Here I basically have a catch all, which comes in handy when you're writing puppeteer scripts, if you uh, miss something or break to just kind of handle what you're working on. So here we're taking a queue. So this is of um, URLs, that we're reading from a CSV file, we're gonna loop through them. Now here, we're not just going to the URL, we, we have a few different options here. So one is wait until network idle zero. Puppeteer, you have like wait until network idle zero or idle two. So what it means for network idle zero is that the network requests that are coming to the page have basically been zero for, I believe it's 500 milliseconds. But basically so that there's nothing else loading on the page. So this way we can be like, okay, the page is loaded. The, the next param timeout for 60,000. Um, so again, this is a millisecond, so it's time a thousand. So this is, I'm gonna wait up to a minute for this page. And, and this is kind of gets to the point of a lot of what Google talks about of fetching pages and then rendering. You know, the reason why is it, it takes a while to fully render those pages and what time they're willing to wait. So this can be handy if you have a puppeteer script that's monitoring your site and you're only waiting, you know, five seconds or 10 seconds or 15 seconds and just understanding kind of um, the performance side of that. 
So next we're gonna take the uh, payload just to generate. So here we're gonna take the response, so the status code. So this is of the final response getting to the page. We're gonna take the URL that we passed in and we're just gonna put placeholders to the backlink, the anger text um, and the rel. And then basically set the existence to false and we're just gonna assume that it doesn't exist and then we'll update it later on. Um, so here, so this is um, kind of breaking this down for those who don't read. JavaScript, but we're going to basically do a uh, document query selector all for all A tags. So this would be all anchor text, and then do a map on it and basically pull out the uh, href, the anchor text, and the rel from it. So here we'll be basically going through every one of those links, checking to see if the link is included in the backlink file, uh, if found, we'll print it out and then basically update the payload, which we can use for either saving to a CSV or file um, or access later. Similarly, for not found, you know, we can just log out and just say we didn't find that URL. Lastly, we'll generate just a simple CSV file of the status code, the URL, the backlink, the anchor text, rel, and if it exists. And then finally, just write that file. Um, so that's the whole fetch function. And I, I'm trying to put a lot of it into more blocks to, to, to understand. And this is what is um, kind of funny from more of a JavaScript perspective. So the first one is getting um, the backlinks. So here I'm just reading uh, a CSV and I'll show you in a second of what the backlinks are. And then using this neat CSV, which is an NPM uh, plugin in order to process that data um, to be able to get it. So here's the actual kind of run script. So we're gonna fetch that CSV, process those. We're gonna then paste them in and pull out just the link and backlink. Then we're gonna actually fetch on all of that array of all of them. And then to give you just a quick example of what the backlink CSV is. So here we just have um, links and then uh, so this is the page we're looking up to see, we're fetching this link and then we're checking to see if this link exists there. So let's run this. So here are all the links that it basically parsed from the CSV and put it into a queue and then we're gonna run through and see where that link exists or doesn't. Uh, I see I don't have a link on google.com. Well, maybe <laughs> one day. But, um, but yeah, so this is just kind of, um, you know, useful to be able to, to run it and I'll, I'll show a script later on, but you'd be able to pull down your uh, Google Search Console data and basically um, run this type of script to, you know, it's important to be able to check on your backlink, see if they exist, you know, to be able to either, you know, make sure it's still there or, you know, maybe to get it adjusted. So then if we go to our report, uh, so basically I grabbed the status code of the page that opened, the URL that I was checking, um, the backlink uh, that uh, it found, and then the anchor text, and then it exists. Um, I'm gonna actually just open this up. Uh, oh maybe see easier in a second. Uh, this might be easier to, to look at rather than just a, a terminal prompt. Uh, hold on one second. Numbers. Yeah, exactly. So um, here we just have the CSV. We have the status code of the page it went to, the URL is on, the backlink, um, you know, if it found it or not, the anchor text from it, and then the rel from it. So, you know, this can be super handy and, you know, a, a variety of different ways. I'm glad you threw Google in there for a good measure. Yeah, you know, it's just one of those kind of fun things, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, So the next one we're going to basically, let's let's open that up and take a look. So now we're gonna kind of switch gears, although it's very similar, but we're gonna look at redirects. So again, we, we kind of define our set options. Uh, we write up basically a standard CSV. So we're gonna grab the status code 
the destination URL, the redirect count, the redirect status, and then the actual redirect. Um, so when dealing with data, um, or when dealing with site migrations, you're constantly you know, needing to put in 301 redirects or 302s or being able to you know, monitor that. So um, here we open up the browser with those um, settings. Again, since we're just looking for redirects, I don't want to download the images, style sheets, media and fonts, you know, all of that. I just want to kind of uh, fetch the page, see if it gives me a 200 or if it doesn't, follow the chain of redirects and go from there. Um, so again, I just do a standard catch for all the, the errors. Um, so here's kind of the, the next step. So similar with the, the previous of the backlinks one, we're gonna go through all the URLs in a CSV and basically we're going to fetch the page again, but this time we're gonna take the response and look at the request redirect chain. So Puppeteer basically provides a way to be able to not only just look at the redirect chain, but being able to look at the headers or the status code uh, of that. So we're just gonna loop over each of those if there is a redirect um, and then add them to basically an object and then we'll both print this object and then again, store this as a CSV file. So it's similar but slightly different. Um, the other side here that I'm doing is if there is a case where um, there's more than one redirect. Uh, I just want to shift the CSV and list it. Um, there's different ways that you could have a multi-dimensional CSV. Um, I don't know if there's kind of preference between people, but um, we'll show you what that looks like in a second. So first, we are going to look at our redirect CSV. So it's very simple. We just have one column URL and then three links. So we're going to run the scripts. It's gonna queue up these three URLs. It's going to fetch them, grab the status code of the final URL, show the redirect chain, show the length of the redirect chain. Um, so here we're having seamless, and then the last case, we're uh, fetching Google. So this is what the final URL is. It started at HTTP with no dub dub. It moved to the dub dub dub, and then finally to the HTTPS. So it's able to uh, see that. And here we can take a look at the headers. So um, there, there's sometimes a need to look at different headers for requests. So it, it's very helpful. A puppeteer um, kind of provides that access. So then again, if we do. Uh, So, so here we have the redirects. So uh, in case to this, oops, this is uh, just going to one of my own sites. Um, there's just the, the one hop. So this added the dub 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 to it. The second one for seamless, it added the HTTPS and we see it's a 301. For Google, you know, it started uh, here it added the dub 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 and finally HTTPS. So here I can see the redirect counts, the redirect status and the status code. Um, I did not put the header in here in the CSV, but I did output it when running the script to be able to take a look at it. And you can see the code 302 there for when they added the params. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, there, the, it depends on what type of data you want to get at, but I, I feel like this kind of provides a lot of the foundation of you know looking up different types of um, information on pages or being able to track and, and see where that happens. And that's probably just them doing a tracker on the redirect for SSL. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there was a question, um, sure. well, a couple of them were uh, already addressed. So uh, the one that's, most addresses, can you open results in Excel? Yeah, sure, if you're opening it in numbers, you can open a CSV in Excel. Uh, but also, can you fill out forms with Puppeteer? The Donald's asked. Um, that might have been before they joined. Join. Yep. Uh, you demonstrated uh, filling in a field at Amazon, showing yep. a, scraping a, a search result from them. Yeah. Uh, so he was curious about that because he's a, used to use Phantom JS. so. Um, yeah. Phantom yeah. JS is actually something I used for many years before um, Puppeteer. Um, I did a, a number of different types of uh, scraping uh, with curl and even with um, 
uh, Ruby back in the day, but um, yep. things have really changed and normalized with Puppeteer because at least now, you know, everything's, for the most part is, you know, it's similar in a scrape that the, what you're seeing or what, you know, a, a bot in when you open up Chrome is seeing. So uh, the, yep. the, the industry has definitely changed. Yeah, and in a, you know, I mean, in a work setting where you might be in a cubicle and somebody says, go grab this, you can just do it in curl and show them something quick versus, you know, taking the time to set aside a, an hour or two to do some, you know, proper work and scraping a whole bunch of stuff. So you still want all these tools in your arsenal, but uh, uh, Puppeteer is sort of the state of the art of this. And yeah. Has Chrome. And, and it really opens up kind of what you want and how you want it. So you may have a Puppeteer script that, you know, goes through, parses something and then saves it to a Google Sheet, you know, uh, and just update yeah. it that way. You know, you don't, you know, and, and that can run both, you know, locally on a laptop or could run in the cloud as a bot to, to process that. Um, so yeah, again, this is just the, the one line where I type in for the form for Amazon, but uh, there's many different interactions you can do with Puppeteer. So whether it be a touch emulation from a phone or it could be a, a mouse movement, um, if you wanna move it to a specific X, Y, and Z pattern on a page, um, you can do that as well. Um, the, I, um, now there was also a bunch of uh, uh, things that you excluded from crawling to streamline. And this, the same fellow, the Donalds asked uh, if, uh, how do you prevent, you know, passing captures and, and, or, you know, maybe honeypot fields. Sure. Are there any, is there any ex experience you have there? Yeah. So there's uh, an NPM plugin. Um, called, I think it's uh, Puppeteer Stealth. Um, there's been a few different people that work on basically mimicking or making Puppeteer look more like Chrome. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can detect uh, that you're you know, from a bot, whether it just be basic from a user agent or a viewport, or even to being able to execute or store cookies or JavaScript. Uh, and understanding, you know, when you visit a page, there's a lot of information that gets passed along to the server for that request that they could then process or continue to track. Uh, in terms of captchas, there's different types of service and APIs to do that. Um, you know, this gets into more of a legal ethical question of uh, scraping. Although the largest scraper in the world is Google, so uh, keep that <laughs> yeah. in mind. Most definitely, and there's nothing illegal about it. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think the, the best one that I love uh, uh, is uh, Matt Cutts back in the day um, did a rather large scrape of SERPs data, which obviously violated their TOS and brought it up to him. And yeah, he's like, but the data is so good. I'm like, well, that's <laughs> exactly you know what we want. So it's- uh, and, that, and that's the thing is terms of service doesn't make it illegal. It just means it's terms of service. You're breaking their terms of service and you know they could come at you as saying, hey, you're trespassing now. I think that's the closest you could get from a legal standpoint as to, you know, kicking back on somebody scraping you. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of different ways you can, you know, look at being, you know, uh, more undetected. There's different types of things that, you know, like the, the slow-mo that I show, you know, there's no way you could physically type so fast into input boxes. Um, so there's ways to detect that type of anomaly, um, as well as other types of requests. So for example, if you need to visit a million pages from the same domain, um, you know, yes, you could use a proxy and request different ones. But at the end of the day, if they're seeing a spike of requests every hour for a hundred of these random, you know, IPs, they can look up and see, oh, well, you know, maybe this, you know, user agent's the same or viewport or different type of navigation setting, like they don't have flash installed or, or things like that. So um, there's still so, yeah. fingerprints. They can, they can get all that because you're sending so much information. Yeah. So, but you, you can, uh, I mean, I saw that, the, the slow mo 250, which you could all, you could see when it was emulating the type, the type method on page.type. I think it, it was about a quarter second. It just got yeah. boom. And uh, so, I mean, you can randomize that too, but it's all, I mean, all these tricks, they can still get you because you because of various fingerprints, like you say, fonts installed or flash or yeah. 
Yeah, and you know, it's just a giant game of chick, you know, chicken and mouse. Uh, I, I will say it's been kind of interesting seeing, you know, the uh, Cloudflare had some issues um, this past week and uh, knowing how many people use that for DDoS protection or other types of uh, scraping technologies, you know, it's, it's been interesting to say the least. I, I use it and, uh, you know, I've, I've used it for their hot linking protection and anti-scraping things, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, th now one final question. We were just doing backlinks. And so uh, Eric Rosenberg asked, uh, you know, there's it looks like you can grab anchors, but what about others, some, some of these other uh, ways that links are powered? Uh, this gets into an issue of, well, is it meaningful to scrape it or not? But things like buttons and stuff that are uh, maybe dynamically injected JavaScript wise and stuff. Are there ways you can go after those things? Uh, yeah, so it, it's actually funny that I'll, I'll show in a little bit one example I noticed um, with a link that was non-detected um, when I do just looking for an, an, a, uh, an, uh, an anchor tag uh, href on a page that I got back from Google Search Console. So here I download the latest links and I realized that page is actually processed as an XML file, but within the XML file, there's a link there. And so that would come to the conclusion that they're running a regex on the actual HTML to then parse out the links rather than use the DOM to actually process and step through it. So it, it's kind of interesting. There's different ways you could um, generate a link. And then there's also the common case of how hard is Google going to work to try to get that, right? Um, I think tomorrow right. you have. Um, somebody talking uh, a bit more about that uh, for one of your streams. Martin. Yeah, Martin, yeah. Um, OK. Uh, so uh, I guess maybe I'll just, so the, I, the there's two other questions I just want to go through. So I highly suggest checking out this pptr.dev uh, for more information on Puppeteer. Um, and then uh, for this issue for AWS, uh, I would say um, you 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 don't have access to um, a disk or storage, so it's a temp file issue. You, you can't run it that way. So, okay. So why don't we go through um, this one a little bit more, and then um, uh, we'll answer kind of some more questions here. So here's kind of this this bonus one. So again, I. I'm just going to, I basically pulled down um, my standard latest links. I, I kind of cleaned them up, just removing a, a few things from here to just be able to show you. But you can go to Google Search Console uh, and, and get those um, links and then just plug it in and, and run this yourself. Um, so here, um, because Google Search Console just gives me the, the basically the site it's on, you know, I'm not necessarily sure which link or what link it is. So I'm going to basically put in my uh, domain here, and then it's just going to see if that uh, href uh, actually contains that or includes it, and then I'll include it in the list. So again, I go through the kind of the puppeteer options. I generate my CSV, so um, your, your status code URL, the backlink, the anchor, the rel exist. Um, and then, you know, again, we launch the browser. We block um, different types of... Uh, uh, resources, we load up the user agent viewport, and then we, we make that request. Um, so we're just, you know, this, you know, very similar, you know, it's just kind of um, slight nuance of, of using this, but the, the kind of key to this is basically when we're looping through the hrefs, we're going to basically search to see if one of them contains um, that uh, domain in there, and then pull it out, and then grab um, that specific uh, link and text in there. And if it's not found, just you know, kind of uh, post that to the logs and then generate that CSV. So here, I'm going to clear this out. So here we run through one of them on uh, GitHub just so again, you know, we have the href. But here, this was one that uh, I saw and thought was kind of interesting and started to talk about. So if we 
want to just open this up real quick and show you a quick live demo. So this page is an actual XML page on here um, coming from Mike King. But if you search, this is the anchor text. Oh, you can't see that. Uh, this is the anchor text that they parsed out there from the link on the page. And so it's interesting when I do an actual look for anchor text, I'm not going to see it because it's expecting an HTML page, whereas this is an XML page. So it came up in my Google Search Console um, link data, but um, when I fetched it, it, it didn't find it. So, um, so that was kind of interesting from there, and then it just kind of goes through there. So taking a quick look at the results. Oh. I'll put that, okay. So again, so here we have the status code, and then in this case, the backlink we you know we don't know it um, of what it's going to be. So here it filled it in um, by just parsing what was included there, and so this way I can find those links uh, as well as the anchor text and rel, and then if they exist or not. So you know again, this you know just kind of useful in terms of script to being able to be like, oh, well, that you know link may not exist when I run it through Screaming Frog. It's like, well, I noticed that it didn't exist, and uh, you know I saw that it was an XML file, and, and kind of went from there. So you know just kind of interesting ways to to look at it. And there's your second row with uh, uh, no yeah. backlink because that was the XML file. Exactly, and so that was just something I kind of noticed the other day, and was like, oh, that's interesting. I'll throw that in to kind of go through it. So that, uh, and uh, yeah, there was kind of another one with Twitter. Um, actually, here, let me see if I can open this up. That is also interesting. Um, so uh, the way they generate or, or, or some of the content, they do a lot of front end um, server side rendering. Um, so it's you know something again you can take a look at, but why it wouldn't have showed up, or why it's parsed. So um, there there's kind of a lot there covering you know different ways of of, of looking at that data. Um, you know that to me what's so fascinating with Puppeteer is there there's just so much you can do. Um, so kind of going full circle back to the initial quick demo I, I showed at the beginning of this is here we have you know, the puppeteer options. We're going through uh, our, our user agent here. We're putting it in actually to the options and passing it in. So this way, this user agent is set as a default um, on the browser and for each new page. Um, and then we're just going to loop through and pull the response code, the URL, and then the page title here and uh, output that to the screen. So. Um, uh, so it's it, it's really interesting, and one of the things that I find, especially working with Node.js, is um, it's single threaded per uh, core. So um, most scripts you run, you're just running on one core, but you can run it in a pool or a cluster. Um, so if you had a four core CPU on your laptop, you could run four threads of Node doing the same process. Um, so if you're trying to do really large sites, you may put that data into some type of queue, like RabbitMQ or database, to then have a worker process through that. So there, there, there's kind of many ways to dive deeper into ways you would use Puppeteer for, for scraping. Well, that's definitely some key information in terms of uh infrastructure if you're thinking about building out a, a tool or uh, you know basic operations on a huge site like that um, have you run into any kind of uh, performance issues on some larger sites and what sizes of sites do you start to see those issues crop up yeah so I, I've definitely gotten blocked on on different types of sites from IP bands um, to uh, to kind of quirks of how some sites may generate um, 
some of their content. Uh, so for example, they may do, um, like you're saying, an href in a button or some other type of um, on-click in order to kind of get that data and go through there. Um, yep. there, there there's, there's, well, so when you think about websites for scraping, in a sense, there's a lot of ways to also hide some of the data on the front end. So um, you may have a web socket that's constantly updating the page that you would not see in the network request. So you may be looking at a page and being like, hey, they keep updating the page. I don't see any um, you know, networking requests or anything changed. How are they doing that? Well, they're using a web socket in order to do it. And um, I guess I didn't kind of dive too deep into this, but um, Chrome actually runs a web socket to interact um, on the uh, development side. So you can open up a Chrome instance and then connect to it and send commands for like a uh, Chrome DevTools uh, protocol or anything like that. Um, and again, I guess just kind of to, um, so, you know, this is uh, pptr.dev. This is where I get any information uh, relating to Puppeteer, super helpful. And then, as I said, you can just go to github.com slash John Merck slash SEL dash Puppeteer. And then here's all the code for everything that I showed um, and some, Great. some notes. So um, kind of happy to dive into a bit more questions from there and, you know, kind of go from there. Yeah, we already got uh, comments that uh, they're, you know, Eric's going to follow that GitHub for sure. <laughs> yeah, GitHub uh, is is one, uh, you know, repository uh, hub. Uh, I mean, Git itself is just a is it's a Linus Torvalds project, but that's gotten, you know, taken up and turned into various hubs. But GitHub is the popular one, and so if you're getting into learning to develop, uh, you're going to want to learn Git, and you're going to want to learn GitHub, and uh, so that you can basically clone these projects. So for those of you who are thinking, oh man, I want to do that and they don't know the, the steps, you know, and, and some people might be thinking, you know, how, where do I start? And so I, I, I would, I would say we, we can get into a quick discussion about basically node and how to get started developing and how to clone these projects and start running commands from the command line, just like you did live here today. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's funny. I was definitely an earlier evangelist in, in Node. Uh, I, you know, JavaScript is one of those kind of quirky things invented in like two weeks uh, by one guy, and uh, right. you know, slowly and surely, we've we've gotten all these new features and things um, with the uh, with JavaScript over the years, and. Uh, you know, server-side JavaScript, as I said, you know, being single-threaded, um, there, there's a lot of performance things that you can do, and 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 it's great that Puppeteer is kind of built into that. But you know, if you also do Python development or something, you use uh, Puppeteer and do very similar type of commands to be able to access that. Um, also, in terms of you know, just come kind of development, you know, it's always good to see what other people have or, you know, copy and paste until it works and, and kind of go from there. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, in, uh, you know, many different ways uh, to go from there. Yeah. And, you know, just to, to uh, you know, uh, further explain what you just said, like JavaScript, the language was invented in two weeks, you know, and uh, um, uh, the fellow was working for Netscape. And they wanted to create, you know, more lively web pages than the things that were uh, looking kind of, you know, uh, uninteresting before JavaScript. And so he took pieces of his favorite languages and built an arguably, he just made a lot of decisions. And those decisions remain controversial to this day. <laughs> um, and that's because there are some, it's a quirky language. So if you get into it, first of all, it's phenomenal. It's, it's highly recommended that you do because it's undergoing this huge uh, uh, renaissance uh, that it, that it initially was only available on the front end. So it was only available inside the HTML pages or, you know, sources that you include in HTML pages. And, you know, this uh, an example of a weird, quirky thing is if you did something in quotes like five minus one, the number one, it would it would equal four. 
But if you did like in quotes five plus one, and it, it would equal 51. And why is that? <laughs> and the answer is that there's all these, there are types in, in all programming languages. And the way that the operators, uh, operands work on types in the JavaScript language can really trip you up, especially in the beginning, because that just doesn't make sense. You know, so five minus one is four, but five plus one is 51. You know, I mean, so I mean, it, it's how the plus operand actually works in two different ways. Yes, on the number type, it will add the numbers in equal six, which is what you might expect. But when one of them is a string, it's gonna turn them both into strings and, and then turn the result into a string. And there, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, or at least the, the, the first item should be a string. But when that happens, it turns the result into a string. And when you concatenate five and one, you get 51. And that is a quirk of the JavaScript language it's not going away. It's going to stay no matter how much modernization, modernization is, is undergoing in JavaScript. So it's a quirky language. But if you fight through all of that stuff, you will find just magical powers under the hood. And that's because it does uh, get interpreted and run in the browser, which is why we have all this reactive code where you can ship uh, a shell, an app shell, and then that app shell can hydrate using JavaScript, pulling more stuff, you know, to, you know, the, the most recent database stuff. And so that's how Facebook basically can change the number in their notification bell, you know, like you've got a new notification, bing, without you having to refresh a page. Now, in the old days, you had to hit, you had to hit refresh to see if you had a new message or something. No longer the truth. And that's because this JavaScript, since 2009, 2006, 2009, I forget, one of those two years it was invented, the, the node, uh, J, the Node.js project was was created, which brought JavaScript to not just run on the browser and inside the browser, but it also runs in the on the server side. And what we just got a whole dose of was John showing server side JavaScript code that goes and fetches things uh, remotely. These you know scraping pages. And so, yeah, that's what you want. You want to learn about the universe of JavaScript, that it exists on both sides now. And the JavaScript can look a little bit different unless you use isomorphic uh, because you might have a modern JavaScript interpreter on the server. But if you're shipping code to an antiquated browser, you want to make sure it runs there. And so that's why you might not have the same JavaScript running on the browser than on the server. So all this sounds very complex, but these are the kinds of things you're gonna to wanna to learn about because they're very important to the SEO uh, job process uh, and knowledge base, you know, to understand how these things are powered and, you know, sp specifically JavaScript problems because JavaScript is getting so popular now. It's yeah. a huge language. Yeah, yeah you, you touched on you know two big things to me. So TypeScript or type language. So JavaScript is like the, the loosest type language you can imagine. With your example of fifty-one, the string, or you know taking a string and getting the length, and you're like, how is that possible? Um, but you know, TypeScript kind of you know locks that down. I've, I've been doing a lot more work with GoLang, which is extremely type sensitive. Um, so it's it's been kind of interesting nuances and and seeing other things. So you know, the examples that I was working, you know, the code doesn't necessarily go bottom to, or top to bottom. You know, it may break off and do certain things. And so now you need to be able to handle that type of. Um, you know, ordering. Um, so in JavaScript, you have things like promises to be able to go through and, and handle that. Um, whereas in something like Golang, you also have like wait groups and being able to fire certain things off. And then when all those are done, you know, continuing on it and going from there. Um, but, you know, there, there's definitely kind of a lot of nuances from there. There's, you know, nuances with, you know, scraping and, you know, different ways of, of getting data. You know, there's also just, you know, some of the storing of data. You know, I, I didn't get too deep into it, but you know, you can use a Google Sheet, but you know, now Google Sheets support BigQuery, so you can, you know, store a lot of that data there and then um, use it to fetch and, and, and kind of come from it. So it's it's definitely, you know, interesting how times have changed and you know how much you can do now um, with all of these tools. And JavaScript is a tremendously fundamental language for the Google company itself. I mean, and it's got all of these projects that it's delivering great tools for all of us web developers. You know, this is really, you know, they're, they're providing all of this to the community and it's because they want people to build interesting sites, you know, cause they've got 
I mean, their business depends on it. They, you know, we've, we've got their Chrome browser and their search engine. They want people to find interesting sites and they want Chrome to be able to, to do it. Yeah, you were using the, uh, the, the promises and the re response object thing. And, and anon I mean, another thing is anonymous uh, function, right? So just, mm -hmm. you just type node and boom. I mean, that might look a bit weird to someone coming from another language. Like, wait, how is this function running? You know, <laughs> you got to look at the, 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 uh, the parens at the end that, that run and it's called an anonymous function. It, it has no name. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely quirky from it, and you know, it's some of the other kind of you know things, especially you know, going through um, thing through just you know some of the stuff or data you want access to, you know, it, it, you know, it depends on what you're doing. You know, I showed a lot of the examples of just removing images or style sheets or something, but you can also do the inverse. You know, maybe you know you wanted to. Um, run a puppeteer script, you can use the network idling and generate uh, or act as if you have a 3G connection or a 2.5G connection or basically a slow internet connection and make that request and, you know, visually see like, hey, this is what the page looks like when you load it on, you know, a phone in the middle of, you know, wherever. Um, so th there's, you know, a lot of different things you can leverage or play with. And that's where, you know, I get to kind of enjoy of like, oh, yeah, you could totally use Puppeteer to, you know, bust out a script to be able to build this bot to be able to get that data or, you know, process that data um, and, and go from there. And, you know, even with Puppeteer, you can post process data. So you may want to just use Puppeteer to download the page. I showed examples using the page dollar sign to process it, but you could easily save that to an HTML file and use something like Cheerio to process it or read that file back into Puppeteer locally and then process it, so. So you could conceivably get the page another way and just use Puppeteer to process your local cache, right? Yeah, and so if you let's when I first started showing some of the headless of being able to just do a DOM dump of a page, not even open up um, Chrome, you could you know save that to an HTML file and then open the page that up and, and, and view it. So there, there, there's many different ways and directions you can you know go from there. It depends on you know what you're what you're doing. Now it um, it uh, utilizes the Chrome Dev Tools protocol, so. How close are they with what you might find in Chrome DevTools? Like those, uh, like throttling is a great example. When you mentioned throttling, it got me to thinking like, oh, I wonder how much of this is, a, is, is in Puppeteer now. Yeah, I mean, you can connect uh, through the remote WebSocket 9 or port 92222 um, and basically leverage a lot of that. You can use this for profiling and performance if you're looking at Web Vitals or, you know, wanting to dive deeper into, um, you know, how what assets are being gen are, are, are taking the longest to make requests. Um, so, you know, maybe you have a bunch of images on your CDN, but maybe you also have a bunch of images somewhere else that your um, reference are calling and it's taking a while to generate those. Um, so, you know, the, that's kind of also why I feel like that pyramid kind of sums it up because now you understand like, okay, at the bottom we have that like headless Chrome of like, there's no window, we're just running this in the terminal to like the Chrome dev tools being able to actually interact and, and, and you know, do all those things that you do when you open up the inspector or look at the console or, or go from there. And then, you know, Puppeteer providing these um, API methods of opening a browser, a page, being able to get the page title, using the page dollar sign or page double dollar sign to do the parsing. And then, you know, finally your script of, you know, what, what do you want to create today? So, so yeah, it's definitely exciting. Yeah, and just a, as a reminder to everybody, scroll down if you've got a question. Uh, we're looking for questions from you guys. Uh, otherwise, we'll just keep talking. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. I think I. So, uh, the, uh, the other thing, I, uh, you know, running Puppeteer in the cloud or on. Um, yeah. There, there's a. There's a lot of weight to running Chrome into itself. You may notice you have <laughs> two gigs of RAM to be running Slack just in Chrome, and it's eating up all of that. Um, you know, there's 
different methods of basically um, processing or, 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 you know, generating the page. But you also got to understand that like Google or, um, you know, there, there's all these things that are happening under the hood that, you know, you just take for granted. Like the fact that I can open up any web page, click on the element in the dev tools and just start deleting stuff. Like there's no code that I could open up a code that's running and just start deleting the code. Like it, it, it's very, you know, interesting to be able to think and be able to handle those use cases or, you know, it's like, oh, well, we have a 404. Oh, well, is it responding with a 404 or does that, you know, domain not have a DNS record and you're just, you know, not getting a response. So, you know, you, you almost have to plan more of like an error first type of uh, process in order to, you know, kind of go from there and think of like, what are all the things that could possibly happen and handle that. So, so it's... You so error handling and doing a lot of catching of those things and trying to. Yeah, I mean, uh, a, a lot of my workflow, I definitely like to just open up the inspector and basically write my functions in code from there. Um, it, it's actually kind of interesting, like how much access you have and being able to, you know, view things because especially nowadays, there's so much stuff that's sent from the back end to the front end with a React or a view app, you know, they may not show all that data on the front end, but they may show that in the request, which can be a security issue or something like that. Yeah. But if you're trying to get to data coming into a page and you're trying to get access to that, you know, whether it be a description or a image gallery or something like that, you know, that may all come into a page. I, I most recently found um, fascinating. Um, I was uh, taking a look at Instagram and they actually provide a JSON object on page load. You just have to find it. And so like now, rather than have to parse it, you just call yeah. that method directly and it provides all the data for you. So, you know, it's, it's just kind of one of these eye-opening things where it's like, oh, well, you know, from a dev standpoint, they wanted to build this because they need to push that to the front end of their client. And you can just kind of hook in and, and go from there, so. All right, I've, uh, Steve A says, I've heard some people recommend using Python to build scrapers. Do you have an opinion about pros and cons of building Python scraper versus something like Puppeteer? I'm not a developer yet, but I'm working on that. So trying to prioritize which languages to yeah. master first. This is a great question. We can talk about this probably all the way through to the end because it harkens a number of things. Which language and the difference between, I mean, Python is great because you could write a crawler yourself without puppeteer at all you just use the i mean it's a great networking language so it has it has the i mean you could build a, a crawler in like 10 lines of code with, with python yeah i mean um I, so i'm not necessarily going to get into a language battle here but you know yeah i know <laughs> I, I, I for me personally you know there's nuances of python that um that uh, i i I don't know. Sometimes I feel like it's almost cryptic because of how short and concise it is in how they, you know, are, are, are building things. Um, I, I will say, you know, either one, just pick one and go. Um, you know, there's so much uh, people like uh, Hamlet that are doing in Python for SEO oh, yeah. or, yeah, that, I mean, I... You know, I, I get really excited because, you know, and, and in some of those cases, they're using Pipeteer, which is basically the unofficial Python wrapper of what Puppete uh, Puppeteer would be for Node.js. Um, so, you know, you can easily do that. Um, for me, there's a lot of stuff um, when you get into uh, more of scaling or performance of, you know, how are you hosting that Python code and then running it, or how are you handling access, you know, different databases, or even just being able to process a worker. So for example, you know, as I was saying, Node is um, single threaded running on a core, but if you have a really large AWS instance with 192 cores, you can run a lot of threads on there. And yes, you can do yeah. threading on Python and stuff like that, but, you know, when you think of a um, more of a platform, but uh, a worker service type of um, analogy, you're just basically pulling down something from the database and running it. And it doesn't matter or need to use anyone else. So now if you're trying to build a distributed uh, platform to do crawling from different types of locations and different types of environments, 
this makes it really easy because you can just dump all that from the database and just have the worker not know and just push all that data back up. So it, it, it you know, it, it really allows to do that. Um, I, I will say, you know, Python has a ton of machine learning. Um, if you're doing using Google NLP or if you're using Google's API for um, image processing, I, I've been just <laughs> amazed at the stuff you can throw at it and it will just pull out the OCR or pull out, you know, the content you can throw up, you know, images, you know, so for example, let's say you take uh, puppeteer, you pull out uh, Google search for, let's say a coffee table, right? You could pull out all your competitors, coffee table pages, search each of those and then pull out their images of their content and run it through to get, you know, keywords and, and stuff like that of how they describe it or, you know, how Google would describe that image. So there, there's, there's a ton you can do from there. I, I would just say, you know, you know, spend five, you know, maybe a day with one or the other, see what you like, don't like, and just, you know, continue on. Um, I, I, I'd say learn, learn both, yeah. you know, but, but, but the thing is that uh, Python, you might find easier and, but understand the basic fundamental differences between the two languages first going in and figure out also the strengths in for the SEO community. Uh, we want to think about what's the strength for our particular uh, job skill. And Python is one of the key languages, but JavaScript is so prevalent and so important now that you can't ignore it. But, Python you might find a little easier. It's basically it uses white space intentionally for its constructs. And then JavaScript, it doesn't. And I mean, you can even put a whole bunch of code on one line if you use semicolons properly. So it's like, uh, that's a fundamental difference bet between the way you're gonna write your, your code. And when it comes to writing the code in uh, Python, it's a uh, it, it's it uses this you know the spacing intentionally like that and it's a language that's a little bit easier because it's uh, kind of confined in its uh, in its uh, in its language domain. Whereas in JavaScript, you have to write things differently depending on what environment you're in, whether you're dealing with server side code or browser side code or there's so much complexity there that it's it's a much larger thing to wrap your head around. So to begin. I probably would say take a look at Python, learn some commonplace coding structure, syntax structure, understand that it's common to all languages because you're gonna find some similarities between all languages. Even Java has some, la some similarities with their, uh, you know, with an if conditional or something, you know, then the if conditional in Python, then the if conditional in, in uh, JavaScript, they look a little bit different because of these basic differences. So if you look at an if conditional in Python, you're not gonna see the, the curly braces like you will, will in JavaScript because they use space for that instead of curly braces. So the fundamental differences are the things where you can see differences between syntax between different languages, but ideally a lot of these a lot of these constructs are the same thing and they have the same effect. So so when you learn one language or when you want to become a developer, remember to think that you know, you don't you don't want to just be a JavaScript developer. You want to know a little bit about some other languages too um, because you're going to be dabbling in them. If you're if you're going to start putting things on a on a, a virtual private server, DigitalOcean or something, you're going to have to get into more languages than just JavaScript. Yeah, I mean it's 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 also kind of interesting in a sense of a lot of the fundamentals are the same. It's just syntax. So you still have if statements in both. You still have you know switch statements or. Um, you know, defining functions or, you know, just understanding that thought process of, of what you're trying to do. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, a couple of cool statements here. Uh, is it, you know, I might have missed this, but I take it I, that it's possible to throttle the scan so you don't inundate services yeah. when doing competitive. Element. And then also we use Puppeteer to scrape. Uh, Google search results based on specific Latin long location results, which is great for local. So those yeah. are cool. Yeah. So uh, for the first one, so there's a page dot wait for, and you can provide um, basically a, a delay in milliseconds. So if you're doing a for loop of each URL, you can basically delay going through each one. Um, Similarly, if you're building more of like a distributed uh, platform or system, you can have like a time to live and then your workers just basically fetching based on that delay. And so you can define that delay beforehand. 
So this way, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've done back of the envelope math where I'm like, okay, if it takes a second a day to request, how many seconds are in a day and how many requests can I get? And, you know, kind of work your way backwards on terms of a single thread. Whereas now if you have multiple threads or workers, you can just kind of, you know, scale up as, as need. Um, so like so, 36,000 seconds in a day, something like that? I mean, uh, well, I think uh, it was 84,000. 84,000? 84,600, right? 86,400. 86,400. So, so if you had a, a request every second, right, and making it to, you know, that's how many pages you'd be able to scrape if it took just a second to, you know, fetch. And we know most pages take, you know, one, two, three, maybe, you know, 10 to load, depending on what it is. Um, so, you know, if, if you're doing large scrapes, you really need to think and understand that or understand, you know, how much, um, uh, you know, requests you're going to be making from, you know, different proxies or, or things like that. Um, well, let's get into the localization because this last, they're, they're, uh, they're loving the idea that you can uh, localize screenshots with Puppeteer. Yeah. Yeah, you can actually use navigation geolocation to basically pre-fill the browser to think you're in a different location or time zone. So if you want to request a page to think that you're from the UK, you can use Puppeteer to generate that Latin long and pass it along. So you know how they normally say, like, can we have your location? And you click, you know, allow or block. You can, um, with Puppeteer, kind of provide that <laughs> at the beginning of the, the request and basically be like, here, this is my location. And, and you know, um, spoof it that way. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of things like that um, that you can uh, get into. I mean, what, what's so fascinating is just like all the, the nuances Google does, especially with maps or understanding what a view is. Um, um, uh, in terms of, of their environment, um, especially when you get into it. So, uh, so this seems like a stack question. Yeah, I've tried quite a few stacks, and the React, Redux, Node, Express, Mongo seem to be very good one to focus in on. Uh, the beauty with a stack like that is that you're learning using JavaScript all the way from front to back. Yep, all the languages are very similar. What you can do in them, just how you do them is different. Uh, pretty true statement, Those, but there are so qu quirks, and JavaScript is the quirkiest. If you learn JavaScript first, you're going to learn the most quirky language on the planet, and then you get into the others and find out how much more structured they are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is funny because even if you had some type of function or command that you use on the front end or back end, there may be some slight nuances. So, like, on the front end, you could you know, parse and, and anchor element and then process that. But then the back end, you, you know, that's coming to you as either a string or something. It's not a node list um, of, of how that, that HTML is. Um, uh, some of the other kind of um, aspects of basically the front end or, or back end depends on, you know, how you either animate or may view that page, you know, the, the interaction from there. Um, I've been amazed, I, I, I don't know, maybe I, I feel like somewhat of a beating of a drum, but just using more pure JS, like the, the need for jQuery was because the browsers didn't support so much of just basic things. But now so many of the browsers are either using Blink uh, for the rendering engine or they, you know, are trying to align more, um, you know, not to have a browser wars of being able to have to have this hack in order to get something to work. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, a big fan of doing just JavaScript front to back. Um, and going jQuery has a new version out just a few months ago. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? It's still around. Yeah. You know, it is not going away. Even, even though Node makes it has yeah. taken over largely for what the what that was doing, and and a lot, and there's a vanilla JavaScript re renaissance going on too. Yeah. So. I, I mean, it's right, reminds well, me. Of, oh, sorry, go for it. I was oh, say, it just ahead. reminds me of uh, WordPress a lot. I'm amazed that like a third of the internet runs on it. Um, right. You know, it's still. just unbelievable. So. It is. It's unbelievable. Well, folks, this brings us to the end of our presentation, but since there are additional questions, uh, we're going to continue the conversation with John now in the Google Meet for anyone who has more questions. The link to the Google Meet is posted in the Q&A. Please join us if you have more questions. If you missed yesterday's presentation or part of today's and you want to watch it on demand, this session will be made available for viewing within approximately 30 minutes. 
Uh, just return to the event hub to access all of the replays. Also come back tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time, our last presentation this week. Uh, and I did speak at length with Hamlet last night where he's gonna be joining us in a future one. Uh, SEO for developers on live uh, with search engine land. So tomorrow's topic is optimizing JavaScript applications for Google indexing with Martin Schlitt from Google. See you then folks. <laughs>